thank you, though, and thanks, everybody, for, for being here. I'm glad to be here myself. Um, okay. <laughs> I have caffeine with me, too, so it's good. So this, present, this presentation comes uh, in large part out of a frustration with what we uh, do in this continued search for some sort of uh, extra political prime mover for, for what we call the Maya collapse now, that is looking for something outside of the political realm to explain what is clearly a political process. And recently, of course, lots and lots of data sets have been used and held up as evidence uh, that there was a period of extended and severe droughts, maybe about 800 uh, A.D. or a bit later or a bit earlier, uh, and that this was somehow causal in uh, all sorts of environmental, economic, and health failures that led to political and then to demographic collapse. And while well, I don't have time to go into uh, details today, uh, in short, Andrew Scher and I don't think this drought uh, hypothesis really works. It poses a bit of conundrum, at least in our uh, study region along the Usumacinta, which is by far the wettest area of the uh, Maya lowlands, and you can see Palenque is uh, the wettest part of this area in particular, but Piedras Negras and Yashilan also uh, very wet. And the long and short of it, these are, these are some of the earliest places to go through this process, this political process of collapse. And why would then the wettest places be, uh, be that, why would that be the case? So in the Usumacinta, this is, this is Andrew slogging through uh, some swamps, which is what we like to do, or used to like to do. Uh, in Guatemala, um, and those of you, of course, in Yucatan, uh, who've been to Yucatan, know that the driest Maya regions uh, doesn't follow that expected political collapse at all. Uh, there's a drought, this, exp this drought that's been uh, touted as causing collapse, and yet places like Chichen and others uh, do continue for longer than these wettest areas of the Usumacinta. Now, the second source or inspiration for my discussion today is also the region where we work. Uh, it's at the edges of both uh, the Mexican and Guatemalan states, and it's only questionably controlled by either. Um, both states struggle really to maintain uh, the presence of, the go of, of governance there in various forms, uh, and it's, it's contested. And these are just some signs of, of that contestation. Uh, settlers who um, take over parts of the Sierra de la forest in Guatemala and uh, enter into conflict with uh, the state forces there. Uh, the uh, antagonism in the communities along the Usumacinta River to dam projects that have been put up, and of course, famously, the Zapatistas uh, in Mexico. So it's a place where the state is essentially uh, non-existent in, in many areas, and, and that keeps us even from conducting research in some places. Uh, and there's not a lot of trust in uh, people from outside of local communities. Uh, trust is only built through long experience with others in super community organizations, through economic ties, through kinship, through other sorts of direct relationships. So these sorts of data, these sorts of observations and conundrums uh, have encouraged uh, Andrew and, I, and, and me to look at these things uh, from a very simple premise, and that is political collapse is a political process. And delving into the political literature on failed and collapsed modern states, it's immediately clear that political collapse is never a short-term pathology. The causes of collapse are to be found in the fully functional and apparently healthy workings uh, of the states that, that precede collapse. Moreover, the failure of a state uh, is not a passive slump into collapse. It requires the movement of political actors kings and commoners, queens and peasants, and I want to emphasize that, that what we want to do here is bring in every level of political actor into this discussion. The movement away from a commitment to the state is a serious political option, and it requires effort on the part of rulers in a failing state to achieve this end, and we have some people who are really trying to, or have tried, uh, to bring about the ends of their uh, states. Um, political leaders can make what seem to them to be rational decisions about maintaining their personal power, decisions they may genuinely believe are to the benefit of the state as a whole, uh, even when the outcome of such choices are to the detriment of the kingdom or the state as a whole. And here's one of our own politicians in the past, Jefferson Davis, who, who did just that. So I'll start with that premise, that people are doing things in these apparently healthy states that move them towards collapse. And I want to draw upon archaeological and historical data to develop a political model uh, 
of the dynamics of growth and collapse in the classic period kingdom centered on Piedras Negras, Guatemala, and on Yashilan, Mexico, in the Usumacinta region. Now to get there, to get back to those pre-Hispanic kingdoms, I'm actually going to begin with a little bit of modern political theory for one aspect of political life that's been heavily implicated in discussions of healthy and failed states. That is the role of trust, of generalized trust between everyone from civil society organizations to the top of the supposed political pyramid. And from there, I want to go back to explore the possibilities of understanding those generalized trusts, not from a sort of a political science academic uh, standpoint, but go back to the ethnographic and ethnohistoric cases in Maya language speaking communities that may give us some more cultural cues that we can use to make sense of classic period Maya kingdoms. And then I want to go back to those classic period kingdoms uh, themselves. Now, when I speak of trust in this context, it's what political scientists call generalized trust. Uh, and the cohesive, um, <laughs> the cohesiveness of a healthy state depends in no small part on the cultivation of this trust among members of society. Trust, uh, there we go. <laughs> uh, these benefits may be directly related to expectations of reciprocities from peers, the notion that everybody's going to chip in uh, their fair share, but people may also be willing to accept and absorb the cost of free riders or shirkers if they feel their participation will yield for them benefits that outweigh the burden of their contributions. So generalized trusters in these modern political models are engaged with and morally committed to society. It's a commitment built through associations of people outside the immediate family, above the level of the household. So if we're talking archaeologically about settlement patterns, we're talking about households working together and outside the groups with whom one interacts regularly. In fact, that last bit is important. Research uh, suggests, by, this is research by psychologists and political scientists, suggests that the weaker the social or kinship ties between the tar participants in such associations, like the Lions Club or, the, or others, um, the more diverse the relationship between the members, the higher the levels of generalized trust expressed by the participants. Conversely, the more one participates with people inside kin groups, in family, uh, in households, uh, the more the scope of generalized trust and its benefit for the state as a whole is reduced all of, over time. Okay. Now, none of this is discussion about collaboration is intended to downplay the role of coercion in holding together Maya or any other kingdoms or states, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. But I want to suggest that forceful coercion has given far too much primacy, been given far too much primacy in explaining why ancient societies in particular operated cooperatively or ceased cooperation and collapsed. One of the potential obstacles in applying political theories of trust, though, built on observations of modern uh, so-called Western societies to our understandings of pre-Columbian societies is that the nature of person-to-person -person relationships of intersubjectivity and understandings of the self uh, and other are not universal, right? We can't apply our understandings of those things directly to the past. Uh, yet among diverse Mayan language speaking communities, ethnohistoric and ethnographic data strongly suggest that a concern with trust and moral action is paramount in constituting society. Betrayals of moral social norms of warfare, feasting, familial ties and friendship cause political rifts and form the central tensions of documents and performances including the Rabinal uh, pictured here, the Popol Vuh and the Annals of the Cachiqueles, or in those histories describing the rise and fall of Chichen Itza and Mayapan from Yucatan. Failure to follow social norms is the source of humor and scorn and can result in the full exclusion from the community or even interpersonal violence. Understanding trust also requires, to some degree, an understanding of personhood and interpersonal engagement. Epigraphic and ethnographic evidence suggests that there is a deep history across the Maya region for the conditional construction of self and personhood, extending beyond the individual as a biological body to include participation in multiple social groups like cofradias, cargos, community governments, etc., uh, as well as material culture that from a European perspective might be considered inanimate objects, but which themselves often participated as socially vital beings. These can range from buildings as at El Zot's, figurines, 
uh, or mountains depicted here at San Bartolo, uh, failure to properly or completely participate in community life, economic, social, political, and religious, can result in an individual body being perceived as an incomplete social person, someone who is morally adrift and presumably less trustworthy. Furthermore, the establishment of trust among individuals, however we construct that, relies on empathy. The empathy, the ability to assess the reasonable expectation that one individual can anticipate the behavior of another. So will potential shirkers actually shirk? Or will all participants reasonably fulfill their mutual obligations? And this is Andrew and I exemplifying our own behavior here. Okay. Making that assessment can be a real challenge. Among the Zena Kantan Sotil of Highland Chiapas, for example, empathy is desirable because it facilitates appropriate social interactions. Yet empathy is also dangerous because it threatens to impinge oneself onto another. It's potentially an act of witchcraft and a so, an act of social, a source of illness. Most in social interactions involve people who believe that the inner selves and intents of others are unreadable and unknowable from outward appearances. They're thus protect, protected from the intrusion of the other. One cannot or should not anticipate motive or outcome in a social interaction and instead the correctness of one's social behavior is evaluated in public spaces where performance can be viewed and assessed. Indeed, among Zinacantecos, Leslie and John Haviland note that it's assumed that all one's business that is carried out where it could be seen or overheard is in fact seen and overheard. At the same time, people report concealing their real intent in plain view, seeking to gain the upper hand with people who cannot or do not wish to read their exterior social facade. The opacity of emotion, morality, and intent is broken typically only in religious experiences, often moderated by priests as representatives of saints and deities. Similar patterns of perceived empathic opacity have been documented in Mopan, Yucatan, and Kachikel communities, among others, suggesting a broader pattern that's arguably part of a Mayan concept of self, uh, other, uh, empathy and trust with a deep historical uh, history. I find this episode tantalizing in this regard. So this is sort of uh, just an aside here that I always find this, this passage in intriguing, this cultural, this ethno-historic passage. When the emperor, uh, Aztec emperor Cuauhtémoc is going with Cortes to Honduras, uh, they stop in the Chontal territories of the, of the Lord Pashpalanacha, and uh, Cuauhtémoc tries to recruit Pashpalanacha to uh, attack Cortes, recounting to Pashpalanacha everything that Cortes has done in central Mexico, all the uh, 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 transgressions that Cortes has committed, and Pashpalanacha observed that the Castilian men behaved well, that they neither killed a single man nor beat a single man, and that they wished only to be given honey, turkeys, hens, maize, and various fruits. He concluded, I cannot therefore display two faces, two hearts to the Castilian men. And I think uh, there's a lot there, there's a lot of ways to interpret this, but I think I see there some of this uh, desire not to intrude, not to anticipate what's really going on beside that, behind that facade and to use observation to, to conclude how to behave. So leaping backward in time, although it's elusive and it's always dangerous to sort of push these things back in time farther, I'm going to do it anyway, there's some evidence for an emphasis on emotional opacity in the art of the classic period. Human protagonists are inscrutable, formally positioned, and starkly contrasted with thriving, fierce, fearful, animalistic antagonists uh, or captives, buffoons, unsavory supernaturals. Such a distinction is not only visible in the monumental and painted art of the elite, but also in ceramic figurines recovered from all sectors of Maya society. The corpus of ancient Maya art suggests the open display of lust, fear, and grief are marked as dangerous and inappropriate for public presentations, though they may be appropriate components of circumstances in which actions are observed by limited, audience, limited audiences or housed in private spaces. And, uh, I just have this up here. This is a figurine we found in our excavations because I like it. These uh, turkey couple, ma male and female turkey, sort of hugging each other in an embrace, and then the stoic appearance of, and the monuments of uh, Maya kings and queens uh, nicely contrast. Now, what all this suggests in considering trust among community members and between the constituent groups within classic period communities is that the trust needed to maintain groups within classic period uh, kingdoms within their communities uh, 
is and was only accessible and realizable through communal activities, through people working together. Daily interpersonal interaction and observation would have fostered trust between actors who, lacked, who otherwise lacked observational methods for securely anticipating the results of future, future social engagements. For actors not in daily contact with one another, highly charged events such as marketing, feasting, participation in royal spectacles, warfare and collaboration and construction efforts, among others, events serve to reinforce the sense of morality and trustworthiness or untrustworthiness of others. And you can still go see uh, lots of things going on in many places. This is just a, a particular startling uh, activity, uh, the, the Dance of the Monkeys in uh, Momostenango, Guatemala, one of the most amazing things I've ever seen where people are spinning around on these slack lines over many, many feet over a cobblestone pavement. A lot of trust going in there, marketing take place taking place below there, and all sorts of people coming together from the outlying communities and participating in marketing, in the observation of these activities. And this is a deeply religious activity as well, so all the, that's going in there together. The recently discovered murals at Kalak Mool, from which I've uh, lifted these drawings by Simon and pictures by others, um, for instance, show men and women involved in the public exchange of raw materials and prepared goods at markets, and remind us that even these most mundane trade activities or seemingly mundane trade activities uh, are trust-building activities. They involve social and physical risks. Uh, in my own experience, uh, the fastest way to build trust in the communities where my colleagues and I work is to patronize local shops, comedores, the small eateries, to go to these markets. You develop these market exchanges, negotiations with people, and you know, when you eat food in a marketplace, there's risk involved there, and a lot of discussions with people in the community members are about which fried chicken check should you eat at, which should you not eat at, which is dangerous to you. Okay, so you, um, not no small risk there. It's an opportunity for us as marked outsiders uh, to demonstrate faith in the local community and the products they create and for the vendors to get to know us as they probe us with questions regarding our origins and motivations for spending time in their communities. And archeology span is a very strange reason for being in their communities, typically. Uh, and so it takes a while to build up those relationships. And that trust and collaboration are frequently not the outcomes of such encounters, simply highlights the perils of these engagements. And here's Andrew looking frustrated by one of these engagements. Now, research by political scientists and others suggests that the more challenging, the riskier the communal activity, the stronger the bonds of trust that are formed. The potential for injury or loss of resources in the agricultural field, for instance, another place where, like markets, I think we tend not to think of them as being so risky or dangerous, but they are. Um, it's more pressing than most modern people think. Beyond the daily threat of bodily injury, and people who work in the fields together in these collaborative groups are often injured out there. Um, a particularly charged situation arises during the burning of the milpa, which can sow discord within and between modern communities. When a milpa is burned and fire must, uh, can't run into a neighboring parcel or escape into the wilderness used for hunting and other resources. And collaboration within and between communities to maintain fire breaks and to coordinate with neighbors when and where burning should take place is absolutely critical. <clears throat> but lack of trust between households, families, and neighborhoods and whole villages can prevent such collaborations with devastating results of uncontrolled burning uh, and we've observed this, um, Andrew and I have observed this in, in places where we work, uh, and our local interlocutors have made it more than clear that those collective actors or individuals perceived to be culpable in such disasters are marked as immoral, untrustworthy, and incapable of proper social action. Uh, though there's always disagreement about who precisely is culpable uh, in all these events. Now remember too that in considering generalized trust, weaker existing social ties, uh, between participants and trust building actions yield higher levels of generalized trust across the polity. And the more one participates in associations with existing strong in-group trust, the more generalized trust is decreased over time. So the more you work with a smaller group, the less you trust those outside that smaller group. And the more you work with people outside your family and your household, the more trust is built up. If households are the basic unit of economic production and consumption, and therefore of de necessary daily interaction, it's the units above the level of the household that are, that are important 
for this idea of generalized trust. Modern and historical Maya social spatial groupings reveal uh, linking individuals and household and larger corporate groups into political structures that were and are uh, cross-cutting uh, in terms of lineage and descent groups and that were themselves couched in and sometimes trumped by territorial and other concerns of practice that created complex social networks of obligation. In hinterland hamlets and little farming villages out there, away from places like Piedras Negras uh, and Yashilan, these super household units may constitute a local community. As part of a larger classic period polity, however, those uh, hamlets were not politically, economic, or religiously self-sufficient. They couldn't do it all for themselves. Now, hamlets inevitably have hierarchical and cross-cutting power structures, uh, resulting in the exclusion of some people and families and households from positions of authority. And the integration of a hamlet into this larger political formation, into these kingdoms, uh, offers the possibility of alternative uh, integrations with power dynamics. Or to put it simply, individuals who might be excluded from authority at home can obtain positions of authority at the larger political centers that, they, that may be more full service. The interpenetration of different networks of authority and political possibilities for a wide range of individuals is well attested in earlier colonial period documents and the multiple titles held by some individuals during the classic period might be an indication of the multiple networks of authority in which they participated and potential networks of trust building or points of fissure where the, there were failures in trust. So with all this background in mind, I wanna, I wanna look back now at the growth and collapse of Piedras Negras and Yashilan. During the pre-classic period, uh, from about 500 BC is, is the earliest data we have now to through, through about 350 AD, there's abundant archaeological evidence for settlements across the landscape between and surrounding Piedras Negras and Yashilan. A lot, a lot of little villages, and these dots don't even do it justice. Everywhere we look, we find pre-classic settlement. None of them are particularly big, uh, yet most demonstrate some form of modest architecture, civic architecture, whether it's an e-group in one place or a ball court in another place or a pyramid in another place. And Piedras Negras and Yashilan are really just two of these kind of dinky little pre-classic centers. That's a technical term. By about AD 350, however, most of those pre-classic settlements are abandoned, and people have really moved into Piedras Negras and Yashilan, and further to the northwest into Palenque and Chiniquija, and they've abandoned these smaller uh, settlements. And Piedras Negras and Yashilan really absorb those populations. It's possible that the advent of these royal courts is accompanied by raids into the hinterlands to encourage movement into the newly established dynastic centers, but there's not really evidence that the pioneering royal courts uh, that appear at Piedras Negras and Yashilan were able to hold in thrall uh, their populace. There's no evidence of a police force, of, of um, dissatisfied subjects could always have walked away. There's plenty of, of empty space out there. Those courts may have offered some sort of relief from instability in the region, uh, and just one example, this is the site of Zancudero, a pre-classic center with an 800 meter wall surrounding uh, this side of it, and on the other side is a swamp and a stream, uh, and this is the defensive wall, uh, gives you a si and, and some perspective on the size there. So it may have been that the pre-classic ended badly, and these uh, courts offered some sense of security and something uh, else there, some uh, benefit. What they may have offered, for instance, are um, activities like ceremonies, performances, uh, that lots of people have talked about. Dynastic rulers needed to garner the trust and cooperation of the populaces they sought to govern. But this class of period, rulership is distinctly personal and effective. It's emotional. It required reinforcement through frequent interaction with the populace that is between the king, the court, and the populace all working together. It's not the king and court just doing stuff. Uh, and people reacting to it. Everybody is sort of involved and participating. And the built environment of these dynastic centers provided a focus for that, for the feasting, the exchange of elaborately decorated pottery that appears at this time. Dances and musical performances, uh, the presentation of captives uh, from warfare, 
It drew society tightly around that royal court. Um, building the environment was also a critical part of the political performance. Detailed studies of the architectural history of Piedras Negras, for instance, point towards an elaborate level of organization and specialist knowledge in many aspects of the planning. That is, we don't know if there are architects, but there must have been very skilled masons possibly attached to the court. And yet, Elliot Abrams and colleagues testing the, uh, the stucco at Piedras Negras conclude that the differences in plaster source and composition indicate collective efforts at the community level, at corporate group or smaller level uh, from throughout the kingdom in plastering these buildings. So people seem to be coming together in small groups and working in shifts and teams and participating in the construction uh, of these uh, palaces. Now the stress and the strain, the social, economic, and physical, because you're at risk physically, you're investing time in the court, you're not growing maize or, or doing what you need to do at home, experienced by members of different social groups working together to build this public architecture, would have accentuated the trust building efficacy of such practices for the political community. The raising of pyramids and palaces wasn't merely a show of control of uh, resources and manpower. And that's how it's typically discussed in the literature that this shows that people had a lot of control over uh, labor and wealth. Um, instead, it actively built society. It engaged king and commoner together, men, women, and children in public spaces in the construction and consolidation of the kingdom. It created the polity. Warfare was also a key to fostering trust for emergent polities of the early classic period. Oriented around the dynasty and the person of the ruler, warfare and especially the pre-combat pre preparations, rituals, dances, song, production of weapons, armor, regalia, procurement of uh, food, and the post-combat rituals of war, including the presentation of captured people and goods and the sacrifice of enemies, involved men, women, and children and brought the community together and highlighted a collective identity contrasted against the untrustworthiness, uh, untrustworthy outsiders uh, that were beyond the limits of moral, uh, the moral community. And this in a particularly sad and kind of gruesome uh, example of, of how everybody is brought into this uh, are sacrificed victims of Kolha that include men, women, and children. But on the other side of this, men, women, and children would have been involved in the production of, of food, feasting, the regalia, and the rest of it. So to be absolutely clear, I'm not saying that trust building is the conscious intent or public discourse of pyramid and palace building. I'm not saying that's what Keynes got up there and said, let's make trust. Okay. Um, nor that people came to believe in dynastic power as a result of participation in these activities. Instead, I'm arguing that the extension of networks of trust between larger than household groups provided one quite possibly unintended mechanism by which the political community that formed around the royal court participated in the maintenance and structure of rulership and the upkeep of the polity. So what about coercion? We have no way of knowing whether the construction of public architecture or participation in combat was voluntary during the classic period. There's no record of this. There's no archeological evidence of this, but there's also no evidence to suggest that Maya kingdoms had the security structures to impose compliance through physical force and punishment. And absent such evidence, we, as say we, Andrew, and I work under the null hypothesis that it did not. Lacking strict enforcement, though, there were undoubtedly shirkers and those who passively resisted participation. But even in modern American bowling leagues, PTAs, business associations, and social networks such as Rotary, Elks, or Masons that have provided the models for understanding generalized trust in modern societies, Participation can only be understood to be truly voluntary if one ignores the deeply rooted social obligations and the imperative of participation for many community members. Community members can be excluded from social and economic capital if they don't participate. It's, it's fun, right? But you get stuff out of it as well. Um, I think we have to imagine that participating in the performance of the Maya polity and the maintenance of its image represented social obligations of individuals to corporate groups or of individuals and corporate groups to service of the dynastic court. There were social, religious, and moral sanctions for not participating in such community activities. There was thus coercion, but much of it probably came from local, communal level sanctions, and not primarily from the hierarchical powers. And there were benefits yielded through participation. <clears throat> 
Now, throughout much of the early classic period, the population of Piedras Negras, as I said, is, is piled in there. It's piled into the one or two kilometer square space of Piedras Negras. These are really small places. These are not Tikal. Uh, these are not Kalakmul. These are very small places, and everybody's really living within view of the royal palaces. But that changes in the, the um, late classic period. So the limited scope of the, of the polities in the early classic period facilitated the centralization of the authority, maintained trust building that focused on the communal activities of the royal court. The potential buffer zone provided by the vacant frontiers, this big space here where nobody's really living, although they're conducting rituals in caves and other activities out there, didn't foster peace. Uh, and the earliest inscriptions from Piedras Negras and Yashilan mention warfare between the two dynasties. For these early kings, victory wasn't, though, about extending territory, but about building prestige, developing hierarchies among dynasties, and uh, redirecting tribute from uh, vanquished foes. Beyond economic benefits, such warfare would also have fostered trust and cooperation within the fledgling kingdom by involving the populace in warfare against a common enemy. But the landscape underwent substantial political change over the course of the seventh century, as the frontier zone that once separated the capital was resettled. The smallest of those settlements we've identified include groupings of low platforms, relatively isolated uh, from other settlements on islands and swamps. Uh, those are real pleasures to get to, or tucked into narrow valleys. And such hamlets lack any obviously special purpose structures like pyramids or ball courts. They have nothing there to provide the sort of ritual activities that we see at the larger settlements. People in those hamlets must have been socially and politically integrated with hierarchical systems of larger and more architecturally complex sites, uh, the most basic of which do have some small ball courts, obviously central architectural groups, uh, non-residential buildings like pyramids, uh, and relatively large central plazas, indicating a wider range of political and ritual activities that can be carried out. One of these sites, uh, clusters of sites really, these are all individual plaza groups here, spaced about 25 to 50 meters apart. Uh, we've named them separately as sites Esmeralda, Ana, and Fideo. Um, the settlements have different occupational histories, but they're all occupied within the same sort of lump of time in the, in the late classic period. And for some administrative purposes, they must have constituted a single political economic unit within the Piedras Negras hinterland, centered on what we call Esmeralda, this clump of plazas and patio groups here. And this is just the architectural center of Esmeralda. Uh, each of those little clusters of uh, settlement, though, is separated by uh, channel, stream channels and clustered in ways looking, the, the buildings in these little clusters look at each other uh, and focus on one another. So they, they probably, in these little clusters, participated more in daily activities with one another uh, than they would have with those in the adjacent clusters. And in turn, these residents uh, were integrated in the larger secondary political centers like uh, Esmeralda here that has a ball court. And this is what passes for a ball court at Esmeralda. It's just a little alleyway between two buildings. Now in turn, these would have been integrated into larger secondary political centers, uh, providing yet more complex political uh, and religious and economic uh, activities. Epigraphic and archaeological data suggest that some of these larger centers were the cores of existing polities brought under control uh, of the dynastic centers at Piedras Negras and Yashilan. And these are places like Bonampak, which gets brought under the control of Yashilan, sites like Lamar and El Cayo, where this monument is from. <clears throat> Others, like Tecolote and La Pasadita in the Yashilan Kingdom, or Butzilha from the Piedras Negras Kingdom, where we're working now, were established from the ground up in the 8th century. They're built, purpose-built, from the ground up as outposts of dynastic power. And these secondary political centers were located at strategic points on the landscape, and they represent critical political, economic, and military resources as territory itself, movement across the landscape, becomes an increasing concern for the rulers of Piedras Negras and Yashilan. Concurrent with the spread of these secondary centers is a proliferation of non-royal lordly titles at both the royal court and its subordinate political centers in the hinterlands of Yashilan and Piedras Negras and other kingdoms, places like Tecalote and La Pasadita. 
And some of these members, some members of the uh, no nobility must have existed before the seventh century, but the proliferation on public monuments reflects a newfound importance as political nodes crucial to maintaining the polity as populations expanded across a difficult, broken terrain, very hilly and uh, difficult terrain to cross. Uh, and as political control increasingly focused on the control of pieces of that landscape. And it's these non-royal nobles, these Sahal, Akahuns, others, who embody these territorial concerns that appeared ever more frequently as captives uh, depicted on royal monuments. So this is what you get at places like La Pasadena and Tecolote. You get the palaces, so just to go back here, palaces where these uh, nobles are receiving tribute or, or receiving the king of Yashilan, arriving. It's a very, uh, just like a miniature royal site in small, but this is actually uh, the center of a, what is essentially a garrison outpost. Okay? And along the northern portion of the Yashilan kingdom is a series, a multi-kilometer series of walls like this one. Here's a reconstruction of it down here. Uh, and those noble palaces are really part of these wall systems. They're indivisible from those wall systems. Okay. If we model the least cost travel routes through the Usumisinta region, the easiest paths to move across, what are in, and, and do it on the computer or just ask our informants or have our own experience, um, the dynastic capital at Piedras Negras is easily isolated on the landscape, and this is why they're so concerned with the territory. It's hemmed in from every direction. Uh, by, other kingdoms could potentially control access to Piedras Negras by controlling the Usumacinta, other waterways, or very narrow valleys that define the landscape. So if you look at Piedras Negras here, there's really just one route coming in from the, from the east, from the central Paten, and people get focused in there. And if Piedras Negras wants to get out, it's very easy to hem them in. Or one route out here, okay, down from Tonina, and one route that goes sort of northwest, south, east, and one end of which is Palenque, and the other end of which is Yashilan, which causes Piedras Negras some significant trouble. Yashilan has a little uh, better time of it, um, but the goods coming in from the north towards Yashilan could easily have been blocked by Piedras Negras. <clears throat> and if we look at the obsidian trade coming down from the highlands of Guatemala, most of the stuff is coming down from up here. Obsidian going towards Piedras Negras can easily be blocked by Ashilan if it is coming by its most direct route. And we've noted archaeologically that Piedras Negras is, is pretty heavily impoverished when we talk about obsidian. It doesn't have a lot of obsidian. We find much more stuff in this uh, tiny little rural sites around Yashilan, much more obsidian than we find at Piedras Negras itself. So as the hinterlands were repopulated over the course of the classic period, the rulers of Piedras Negras and Yashilan vied for control over as many of these very limited uh, routes along the north-south valley of the Usumacinta mainstream, the north-south overland valleys just east and west of the Usumacinta, uh, and the narrow valleys running out to Tabasco, east into um, the central Paten. Now, the conduct of warfare was only one of the responsibilities of the border lords and their elevation uh, by the kings of Piedras Negras and Yashilan more broadly relates to the objective of achieving territorial stability, controlling these routes. These nobles and their petty courts bridged the political lives of hinterland communities, small places like Esmeralda, Fideo Anana that I showed you before, and those places like Tecolote, La Pasadita, bridged those uh, hinterland communities and the dynastic centers and formed social and political cores around which frequent, often daily, community interactions were focused. Labor, tribute, and trade went towards these secondary nobles. The rise of subordinate nobles as archaeologically and epigraphically visible political actors was a process of political innovation, innovation intended to stabilize the polity by strengthening the immediate allies of the ruling dynasty and to control the landscape through the social and political linkage of these allies to more locally empowered political actors in hinterland hamlets. This was the, these were the tools, the conscious choices made by rulers, the nobles, and the communities to stabilize and grow the kingdom. Uh, and in this light, it's interesting to note that uh, ball courts have not been found in any Yashilan subsidiary center, and yet they feature prominently in the iconography of the political capital, which possessed two ball courts. 
uh, including one that would have been openly visible and accessible to crowds of hundreds of observers on a broad plaza. And so too, the primary stage for the performance of war rituals at Yashilan, Hieroglyphic Stairway 1, is located in the southern half of the main plaza. Though perhaps more restricted than the ball court, the plaza is nevertheless large enough to accommodate lots of people, far more people than could have been a con uh, constituted the elite sector of Yashilan itself, the, the downtown Yashilan itself. And so this suggests that there's a conscious effort to centralize highly charged group practices like ball games, rituals associated with warfare, uh, spectacular displays, feasting, um, in Yashilan itself, bring people in from the countryside, even as they're dealing with the tension of more of these rituals being performed in the countryside. Secondary centers, though, are also built with large plazas to accommodate uh, masses of people. And the form of these secondary centers and their monuments suggest that central plazas there are also sites of spectacles, including, but not limited to at all, the presentations of captives and ritual dance. And again, the hints that the kings recognize this tension, recognize the dangers implicit in this uh, sort of dissipation of power to the countryside, the kings of Yashilan almost always appear on these monuments from uh, secondary sites. It may be that the king himself travels out to these secondary centers to perform before his subjects, perhaps in an effort to create an effective personal connection between the hinterland peoples and the royal court, uh, and the linkage uh, or maybe just the linkage between being an image that is for the classic period Maya, uh, there was the connection, the image, and the self were the same thing, um, meant the king was in fact ever present there. It's telling that though the rulers of Piedras Negras and Yashilan could exert military force and political influence up to 100 kilometers from their capitals, they could launch military expeditions that far, they really don't have political bureaucratic structures available that permit them to effectively integrate settlements at that distance, uh, or any greater distance beyond at most 30 kilometers uh, from the site capitals, from the kingdom capitals. So they're really struggling with how to expand the kingdoms uh, with the tools that they have at hand. Some political scientists suggest that at least for modern societies, there's been a movement away from trust relations and towards what they vaguely define as externally regulated behavior, which is just a sort of a vague way of saying cooperative behavior is incentivized through legal structures, commerce structures, medicine, science, uh, lots of other behaviors that we'd sort of take for granted in, in modern state societies. As modern states expand, they require political economic mechanisms to replace those local identities and face-to-face -face interactions to maintain the cohesion of the political community. And so what I'm suggesting here for the use of Macinta and Maya kingdoms in general is that those kinds of mechanisms are never well developed. They're going to always rely on trust. And we can get uh, another glimpse at what I think is going on in classic period kingdoms by leaping ahead in time again to the Quiche kingdom of Guatemala. And there the famous uh, Popol Vuh tells us that early in the life of the kingdom, ruled from Gumarcaj, all is well uh, after they conquer everybody and bring everybody to have feasts. Um, but as the kingdom expanded territorially, it could only do so by relying on ennobled lieutenants who were rewarded with offices, titles, and regalia, a process that the authors of Popol Vuh thought responsible for the weakening of the kingdom and the gradual disillusion of, of a lot of the moral components of the kingdom. Jumping back to the classic period of Sumacinta, the final conflict between Piedras Negras and Yashilan dynasties is a head-to-head -head confrontation that almost certainly took place uh, in the borderlands, in the neighborhood of some of these secondary centers like uh, Tecolote or La Pasadita, uh, where for the first time in 300 years, a ruler of Piedras Negras was taken captive by the ruler of Yashilan around AD 808. Yet after the record of this victory was inscribed on a lintel at Yashilan, the royal courts of both places ceased to dedicate inscriptions and populations across the landscape entered a century or more of gradual decline. And so the picture is really striking. The kingdom of Piedras Negras and Yashilan had appeared before AD 808 to be really at the height of their power. They were building palaces, they're building buildings, they're putting up some of their most famous uh, monuments. And in centuries past, they had weathered the loss of kings before. Yashilan kings had been captured or lost battles. Piedras Negras kings had been lost uh, in battle. Um, 
and they had rebounded. They had, they had grown again. Uh, and without a regional rival, once Yashilan conquers Piedras Negras, why didn't they just take off and, and continue stronger than ever? And yet Yashilan's history also falls silent. So the seeming paradox presented by the rapid demise of the dynasties at the height of their territorial extent, at the height of their population levels, and there's no indication of uh, decreasing health or and the height of their rhetorical pow power reveals that these political entities were more fragile than the monuments and the buildings of the late 8th century would have us believe. Rather than polities at the height of their power, both kingdoms had really for decades or centuries been politically weakened. They'd been in political decline. They'd been failing, but we haven't recognized that as failure to this point. The poles of political integration and disintegration aren't starting and ending points. They represent uh, potentials that are resolved in, in political practice as states and kingdoms kind of teeter back and forth between strong centralization, failure, collapse, and potential recovery. And in the case of these classic period Maya kingdoms, the collapse of legitimate royal authority is really the outcome of dun, 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 the very same processes that have been used to extend dynastic rule across the landscape. So the very things they've been doing to push the kingdoms outward are what eventually make them collapse. My apologies benefited from their small size, and it's only about, I just want to harp on this, it's only about three days walk, if you do it in the dry season, from Piedras Negras to Yashilan, and people today still do this walk uh, relatively frequently. Uh, and if you go by river, it's only a few hours. You can get on a canoe at Yashilan or a raft and be at Piedras Negras for dinner if all goes well. Um, but portable images of central authority in the state, like coinage in Europe or Asia, are not widely disseminated in any form that we can identify archaeologically. So the diffusion of, of daily practice away from the polity capital, away from these kingdom centers, as people moved out into the hinterland in the late classic, um, combined with the evolution of, of, or the devolution of formerly royal prerogatives onto those nobles in the hinterland, uh, the construction of architecture in the hinterland, performances of texts inscribed on monuments in the hinterland, the feasting and other communal activities that, uh, that people are performing in their daily lives are increasingly focused on local communities in those hinterlands, not on the kingdom as a whole. They're not going back to Piedras Negras and Yashilan to perform them, although clearly, as I mentioned at Yashilan, the kings at Yashilan, the queens at Yashilan want to bring them back there to do that. More of that's really taking place out in the countryside. The construction of palaces and other monumental architecture in the hinterland, in the hinterland uh, for instance, divides work efforts that in earlier periods had been focused solely on royal undertakings at the political center, and which had fostered generalized trust in a society that supported royal authority. At least some of these buildings may have been designed and overseen by royal masons sent out by the royal court. And I, uh, this doesn't really show you in detail, but these buildings, as at Tecolote and Bonam Park and La Pasadita and Chico Sapote, uh, they have some slight variations between them, but they're all essentially replicas of one another. Somebody from the Ashilan Kingdom is going out and building these replica buildings all over the place. Bonam Park is simply the most well-preserved and famous of them, and they look a lot like these uh, places at, at Yashilan itself. But the work crews, the most parsimonious explanation, at least, for the labor pool that actually built these is that they're drawn from local community members, people who live in the vicinity of secondary centers and whose labor, contribute, labor contribution to the kingdom is now being directed towards the construction of non-royal buildings rather than royal buildings at the polity capital, at the kingdom capital. People only have so much labor to give. They can only be taxed so many times and brought in to do work. And as public work efforts atomized and localized work groups, trust too would have been atomized and localized. And so when we look at the construction of buildings across the kingdom and in the kingdom centers, we shouldn't just uh, look at this investment in monumental architecture and the immediate environs of dynastic centers to estimate the size of the labor force that the polity can mobilize. That's also something that we typically do. See how big the pyramids are in Tikal or Piedras Negras or Yashilan. Archaeologists need to move towards an understanding of how workforces are mobilized across the entire kingdom, from center to periphery, to serve different power centers. And we should seek some manner of quantifying the ratio of effort invested in monumental architecture in the kingdom capital and that which is 
invested outside the kingdom capital in the hinterland at sub-royal courts or differently royal courts like Bonaparte. <clears throat> the epigraphic data also suggest an increasing reliance by dynasts on their war captains over the course of the 8th century to provide the captives claimed by the king. So here we have Piedras Negras, Stila 12, showing the victory of Piedras Negras forces over captives, over warriors from uh, Pomona. Here's the ruler of Piedras Negras. Here's the ruler of the site of Lamar uh, with captives. And here's the ruler of Lamar at his own, on his own stela, uh, depicted with the same captive, uh, mentioning the same captive shown on stela 12. And there's no evidence that the Piedras Negras ruler actually is out there in battle performing those activities. Instead, these captives are probably being delivered by these subordinates who deliver them as part of their tribute. So trust building uh, is probably taking place less frequently bef uh, between more widely dispersed groups. People are living more widely and they're performing those trust building activities in those non-capital places, each with a smaller population representing a more discrete community than could be found around the capital of earlier periods. Activities focused on these smaller political centers didn't foster kingdom-wide trust nor did they actively link local society into the kingdom as a whole. People in the hinterlands were no longer as deeply involved in the image and performance of the kingdom as embodied by that dynastic court, and this played a critically important role in the political dissolution that followed. So to summarize the general argument for Piedras Negras and Yashilan, the processes that royal dynasties used to expand their authority, the uh, devolution of, of titles and power, and authority to those outlying nobles was a very successful process. It was a good choice for expanding the territorial limits of the kingdom. Uh, but Maya polities were most coherent when the populations were relatively nucleated and focused on the dynasty and the royal court. Generalized trust was built through direct interaction, through spectacles, feasts, sacrifice, monument dedication, ritual performance with dynastic rulers and participation in group efforts such as the construction and warfare focused on the body, on the person, on the center of the king and the royal court. In our study zone, this is true of populations nucleated around the capitals in the fourth through sixth centuries AD. And these nucleated polities were what we might call strong kingdoms that could control their territories and deliver the full range of a high quality political goods to their citizens. They were you know, powerful, strong, upstanding uh, kingdoms. But as the Western Maya kingdoms of the Usumacinta expanded to become more broadly territorial and spread out, dynastic courts innovated on that political structure, not through new mechanisms of political integration between ruler and commoner, but rather through the creation of royal proxies in the hinterlands in the form of subordinate nobles, client kings, border lords. Royal courts become less able to deliver some political goods like the moral and divine performance of the ruler. And at the same time, those labor uh, demands on the populace are diverted away from the dynastic capital to support the growing network of noble lords. People spent less time in the capital centers and interacted with fewer and smaller units of super household action. Lords uh, empowered by the monarch may also have threatened the authority of the heads of local household because this brings them to conflict with local, long-standing local authorities with a longer history in the hinterlands, and that may further have eroded the units of society. So in so doing, they move a uh, kingdom from a strongly centralized community to a weakened and eventually failed and atomized kingdom. The kingdom no longer occupies a unique or necessarily desirable political role, and the loss of any particular king through warfare or natural death removed the impediment to natural fissioning. So why did the Piet why did Yashilan not recover from its victory? Why did Pietras Negros not recover from its defeat? There was no need for those kings anymore, those rulers anymore. Lesser lords may have attempted to fill the power vacuum in this fragmenting landscape, but they couldn't effectively occupy the role that had uh, been occupied by royal dynasts. And this is a telling monument where uh, a Sahal, a noble, claims to be um, a noble from a kingdom for which we have no uh, contemporary record. That is, the king of this kingdom is gone, but as far as we can tell, but the nobles still claim to be a member of, a, of that non-existent kingdom. 
As dynastic power dwindled and the polity fragmented at the beginning of the ninth century, material and daily practices diverged at the capitals. Uh, okay. Uh, so things broke apart. <laughs> Okay. Thus, the so-called Maya collapse in the Middle East and Masinta must be understood first and foremost as the failure of the political system that in turn triggered the later demographic, demographic decline in the region, which I would have talked about a second ago. Okay. Uh, in conclusion, the patterns of political growth and disillusion uh, can't serve as a model for everywhere, but it works, I think, here. Okay. Um, we can't quantify man hours invested in construction efforts and read them simply as the signs of the ability of the state to mobilize populations in which more powerful and populous kingdoms build bigger centers than less powerful and less populous kingdoms. Instead, they represent the negotiation of dynastic power with competing interests from the elite and from society as a whole. They represent the involvement and restructuring of civil society that can benefit or, as suggested today, eliminate the power of the state in no small part through the dissolution of trust. And finally, uh, this whole discourse is intended to find political explanations for political processes like the Maya collapse. Thank you.